Hey everybody, welcome. It's Red Hook Talk on a Saturday afternoon. Uh, welcome to the show. My name is Shannon O'Loughlin. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and the executive, what am I? I'm the chief executive <laughs> officer and attorney for the Association on American Indian Affairs. And today we have a very special show where you will get to go behind the scenes a bit, um, behind the scenes of the Association on American Indian Affairs and meet the staff that uh, make all of our work um, uh, that we do in Indian country possible. Um, so let me get on with it. We're missing one person. We're not sure where she is. Jamie, Jamie, if you're out there, <laughs> get on the show now. <laughs> um, but let me let me uh, pass this along. Colleen, would you like to introduce yourself? You're a you're a veteran of the show now. Yeah, Ani, Bojo, everybody. Good evening. I'm Colleen Medicine. I'm coming from the heart of Anishinaabe territory in northern Michigan. As always, it's a pleasure to be here. Me, Gretch. I'll pass it over to you, Caitlin. Oh, wait. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Jamie. Yes. Hey. You're I'm here. What, what happened? Did your hair go gray since last I saw you? <laughs> I just washed it. <laughs> No way. <laughs> I have I had to turn on the air conditioner. This place is so hot here in Arizona. <laughs> I hope it sounds okay. <laughs> no, it, it must be the 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 reflection of the light on your hair gives it this kind of like silvery color. It's it's kind of cool actually. But we're in the middle, Jamie, you're late. I know. We're in the middle of introductions and now it's Caitlin's turn. And then you can introduce yourself, Jane. <laughs> Caitlin. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin. I'm the new Public Affairs and Outreach Coordinator for the Association. I'm a citizen of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. Like Colleen, I'm in Michigan, but not like Colleen, I'm in the Lower Peninsula, which is kind of a drag, but there it is. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. Caitlin, our new Public Affairs and Outreach Coordinator. What is this your, you finished your second week now? Mm -hmm. Yep. Going into your third week. It's incredible. And then Jamie, our newest addition at the association, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Jamie Marcus Bratcher, and uh, I am a citizen of the Oglala Lakota Nation. Uh, I finished my first week, <laughs> and I'm happy to be here. Yeah, one week. Uh, and, and Colleen's been, you've been around now three months, right, Colleen? Uh, Four. Just, I'll be five next week. Oh, we're in April. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't even know anymore how long I've been around. Um, uh, but really happy to have the three of you um, at the Association of, of Affairs. Uh, Association of American Indian Affairs. I have to apologize right off the bat. Um, even though you know that I kind of um, stumble over my words every now and again, um, I got my uh, vax on Thursday, and I still feel like I'm a little bit um, um, not all there, uh, but uh, I, I'm sure I'm, it's much better than the alternative, so I'll, I'll work through it. Uh, but happy to have everyone with us in the chat. Um, I see Benjamin Duncan Browning saying hello. And please don't hesitate if you're watching us from Facebook or YouTube or Twitter. Um, jump in there, say hi, tell us who you are, where you're from. Um, if you've got any questions for the staff at the Association on American Indian Affairs, this is just a chance for us all to get to know each other, talk about things that, that uh, we want to work on at the association, and then maybe some other stuff. Like, uh, so we've all watched Rutherford Falls. Just I, the third, uh, first episode for me. In here. Yeah, also just the first. It was great, though. <laughs> Don't give anything away. J Jamie, did you watch? Did you get to watch um, it? So I did a podcast interview this morning and then we've been sitting as a family and watching it because we're almost done with it. <laughs> it's 
so I went to go turn on my computer and it was dead and I was like, ah, I thought I had to. And so we're, we're deep in, we're all the way to episode seven. So right. <laughs> I'm done. I watched all 10 freaking episodes and I'm uh, completely addicted and hooked. And I, I've got a little, let, let's play the trailer real quick and we can, we can talk about it a little bit if y'all want to. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me, let me work the buttons here. Uh, here we go, let's, uh, we're gonna share the screen. All right, audio, here we go. All right. Well, that was one of the trailers. Um, not the uh, really interesting dynamic that's going on between those two like lifelong friends, uh, the character played by Ed Helms, uh, Nathan Rutherford, who is like the town uh, historian and legacy of who founded the town 300 years ago next to the tribe and they use the name, what's the name of the tribe that they use? Um, the Minishanka. Minishanka. Um, kind of like Minnetonka, Minnetonka. <laughs> took, that, took that Minnetonka word back and, 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 and fixed it. And uh, the uh, female character, I'm forgetting her name already. Uh, Regan. Regan, yes. <laughs> Who, who was one of those who left, left the res, got educated and came back. And now she's faced with a, a, a few sets of struggles coming back home and then having this friend who um, seems to be a little bit selfish and into his own, um, his own culture and history, sometimes forgetting that that's around him, right? So what are y'all thinking? I can't wait to watch more. I have to figure out how to get to it though. I just only watched that first episode last night. So I'm, I'm in, I'm in, I'm hooked. I gotta get it. Yeah, the, the Peacock app, you can watch, <laughs> I think you get it free for seven days. You can watch it for free for seven days. And then it's like $4.99 a month. And it looks a little bit like Hulu, but anyway. Okay. I'm not here to advertise. Uh, <laughs> we didn't get paid for that advertisement, so. Uh, we're only here to advertise for Rutherford Falls, which was uh, an awesome show. So is the animation at the beginning. The um, intro was cute, yeah. I could watch that animation over and over again, and it tells all these little stories that are actually going on in the show. Yeah. It's a cute... It's cute. Explore. I mean, it's a great way. I think that they're exploring the topics that uh, we're talking about, and they do it in a really real way. And it was neat to hear them uh, talk about that in interviews and how there were so many Native writers. I I heard uh, Ed Helm in an interview, and he said that it's the largest group of Native writers that they've pulled together for a mainstream Hollywood project, which I thought was just so neat. So. And and it and it, you could you could hear it in in the script. I mean, it it was clear. I was laughing at stuff and and wondering if other people are going to find the humor in the same place as I found the humor. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't really care either. <laughs> I, you know, that I was it was just such a good feeling uh, to see something on, on a national platform like that, that, that spoke to our issues. I mean, it's educating and, and being funny at the same time. Um, Sierra Teller Ornelas is the, um, uh, writer, um, who brought in Ed Helms and Michael Shore to create, um, create that. And it's really all her stuff. Um, I think she, I was reading a little bit about her, and she had uh, developed this a long time ago and people basically told her, oh, it's a really great show, but no one's gonna watch this, right? Hmm. No one's gonna watch that. No one's well, gonna watch that. <laughs> yeah. It was pretty Here, funny. So. You finished the whole thing. I did episode seven, we've all watched it. <laughs> oh, it's great. It's really interesting to see like that friendship dynamic just even in the first um, episode because 
in a lot of ways it's like it reminded me a little bit about some of my own friendships and like interactions that I've had with with others and 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 I I just thought wow like to see this represented in in this space and like watching it on TV and like in my own home and like how representation is there and I've noticed like just lately we've been Native people have been getting a lot of representation in like literature and in Hollywood and just I think that's really great and I think um you know as long as our stories are being told in like a, that good way like it seems really like exciting for Indian country yeah yeah really really exciting um uh the wife of the head of the gaming uh, corporation is actually um, Kimberly Guerrero, who's in our Council of Advisors, in case you didn't know oh, that. Oh, I didn't know that. That's yeah. Awesome. So she's been on Red Hoop Talk before um, in, mm -hmm. a, in a past episode. Um, and of course, uh, Bobby, I'm forgetting his last name. He plays um, the casino worker. Um, he's from the 1491s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, right. And, and there's some guest spots of, of some famous Indians that come up um, at different times in the show. So it's, it's just really great to see that. And, and Tracy, Tracy Marquez, are you related to Tracy, Jamie? Uh, she may or may not be my mother. So <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, do you want to admit whether you're the mother of <laughs> Jamie Marquez? My mom is amazing. She and I do all the stuff together and we're in different states, but um, she's awesome and follows everything. And so I had been telling her, you got to watch the show. You got to watch the show. And last night I posted about it on Instagram and she goes, okay, I'm going to go get the Peacock app and go find this to watch it. And I said, well, text me what you think. And um, as she started watching she goes oh my gosh the land back shirt right there in the front <laughs> right there young kid right at the beginning of the show wearing the land back shirt exactly yeah yeah hey, so you should invite them to red hoop talk Who, who's that some of the actors <laughs> actresses we should invite them yeah absolutely i hope they have time they would have time for us it was great that um Illuminatives um, put that together last night. There was a watch party for the first episode and they even had a recording of uh, Secretary Deb Holland um, at the beginning, kind of welcoming everybody and, and uh, uh, talking about how grateful um, she was to be able to see us right on TV. Um, it's such a, it's such a good feeling. I just feel my heart lifted. My grandmother, if my grandmother was around, you know, to actually see us on TV, it's just, it's, inc it's incredible. I'm really grateful. We're in a much different place today than we were 50, a hundred years ago. Right. Let's hope. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <sighs> okay. So what else is going on? Do we do we need to talk about uh, Rutherford Falls? Except everybody needs to go <laughs> to go watch it. Um, I don't want to give any spoilers. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> We're so much further <laughs> along in it that it's like <laughs> we won't ruin it for you guys. We'll let you enjoy it. <laughs> yes, yes, and then let us know. I what get so sad have? when people ruin shows for me. So. I'd be, I'd be bummed. <laughs> me too, me too. I think one thing I would like to say about it, though, is that, like, what I really, really enjoyed was the subtlety of it. So a lot of times I feel like things I've seen where natives are included in on-screen productions and maybe not so much behind the camera, um, there's, like, an over-explanation of stuff that really takes away from the story. Where with this, like, you're watching it and it just, like, you just get it and it makes sense. And that's really lovely. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and the dynamic between the two best friends, where you see um, uh, see the female character going, mm, "Is it really that way?" You know, and and um, and then the Ed Helms character going, mm, "Yeah, maybe not." <laughs> you know, so there's there's this kind of really subtle. You got it right on the head, Caitlin. The subtle understanding of of the thread they're trying to. Um, uh, pull out of there. It's just, it's really great. And I, I want my son to watch it. 
Um, it's, it's more education than what he's getting in public school about Native Americans, right? Um, so uh, uh, I would uh, use that uh, in all Native American uh, public school education classes. Just watch Rutherford Falls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is the little looks on their faces where she she's <laughs> looks to the side and it's uh, the feeling that you get when you're with other Native people and you hear something and you both kind of look at each other and you're like, did they just say that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. It isn't overly subtle. The conversations often take place in private, you know, and you're not having those discussions typically in mixed company in my experience. So it is all those little faces that she makes like. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. All right. So, how is y'all's weekend going, and what should we, we be doing next week? What what are we what are we going to be focusing on? I know we've got a lot of work regarding the repatriation conference. Um, uh, should we um, talk about some stuff that's upcoming, um, or am I getting ahead of myself? Colleen, you're always good to kind of rescue me from getting too far ahead of myself. Um, we should actually be talking about each other a little bit more, I think, right? I think whatever feels organic. Let's just <laughs> let it flow. Let's not put our label on it. <laughs> Let's not make a plan. And we're just going to go um, with the flow. I, I mean, yeah, I would love for, for everyone who's with us tonight to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, this this team here and and a little bit more about, you know, our work. So whatever feels good. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, um, Jamie, I know um, you're the, the youngest of the team as far as tenure. Um, and you've got a really interesting background. Um, can you talk a little bit about how um, you're Oglala? And I know you've, you've mentioned that you didn't grow up there, um, but you came back there in a really interesting way and how you've kind of been reintroduced through your career choices back into Indian country. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. My, I, I was, this, the project I was working on this morning was actually um, really talking about language and fluency. And so I was, I mean, I feel like the whole day now has been just me reflecting on like how I got to this place right now. So um, I didn't grow up in Indian country. Uh, I grew up in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and it, it was- So oh, that's not Indian country? Well, it is Indian country, but not on the reservation. The reservation is about, um, well, where Smoke Signals was filmed there, right. uh, which is, you know, everyone knows that movie, I feel like. And uh, it was, I remember watching that for the first time and being like, I know where that is. I know. <laughs> but uh so I grew up there, but just separate from culture, all native culture at all. Um, when I was little, we used to go to Butte, Montana, and that's where my, my grandma, my great grandmother lived. And we would uh, visit with her and she had a routine that she would have us, you know, she'd like to go to the KOA and get her chicken. It was go sit in the woods and, you know, <laughs> visit with us and then have her drive us, drive her back to town. Anyway, um, so when she passed, we just kind of lost all the connection to any to any native communities at all. And my mom and I slowly started going, attending powwows and such. And um, we were at Gathering of Nations in 2019, and we happened to sit down next to um, a, a or a man and a woman sat down next to us. And my mom just were chatty people, and so she started chatting it up with the the guy's wife. And he goes, she says, "Oh my." family is, you know, my husband's family is from the Pine Ridge Reservation. Maybe they know each other. And we started, you know, doing the name dropping like you do. And he, his ears perk up and he looks over and realizes that we're family and we're related. So, um, you know, it's the first time that we've encountered someone that knew my great grandmother and my grandmother. And you kind of know when they know somebody because he goes, she was kind of ornery, <laughs> which is not typically something that people say about, uh, someone that has passed and we were like oh you did know her <laughs> <laughs> so my mom and i have been slowly um you know participating in language class and lear learning the language 
really reintroducing ourselves to the culture um, by way of learning from anybody we can. And so um, my background's in technology and I moved into podcasting. Um, and so it's, I am a bit of a storyteller and clearly a talker and that has led me down this path to end up here today. So, <laughs> hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, you developed your own kind of podcast uh, rule of thumb, and you've been helping other companies and nonprofits mm -hmm. work on their podcasts. For us, uh, you're going to have a few hats on as well as office manager and taking care of all of our uh, admin, and and but also hoping that you'll help us with Red Hoop Talk. Yes, absolutely. With Caitlin. I've been watching for a while and it's exciting. It's weird to be on. <laughs> well, isn't that, is that how you found out about the position? Yeah, I was following the Red Hoop talks because I'd been watching them and then it was posted. And because, you know, my husband always, uh, he's like, how did you come across this? And how did you get involved? And I was like, I was just listening to the Red Hoop talks. And then they started, uh, they said there was a role available. And so I just applied and, you know, and here I am today. So, you know, the rest is history. Yeah, exactly. for sure. For sure. How about you, Caitlin or Colleen? I don't know who wants to talk first. Tell us a little bit more about how you made it here. Go ahead, Caitlin. Yeah, sure. Um, so specifically, Colleen and I know each other from before. And she shared a post that the association was looking for somebody to do public affairs. And um, I have done communications work in the past and really wanted to transition to working for a position that would help out Indian country and like utilize those skills that I had. Um, but yeah, uh, I didn't grow up, I, it's weird. So my family still lives by Sioux Tribe in Sault Ste. Marie, um, but half of my family lives down here in the Lower Peninsula. So my childhood was kind of like, I don't know if split between the two is fair, but I used to spend the summers living with my grandma um, just because I really enjoyed it up there. Um, it just feels like a place where I don't know that I've ever felt more at home somewhere else. Um, so that's sort of my connection to that area and to the land. And then I would say I had the opportunity to take a good way at university, which is kind of weird, um, but was really cool because it was taught by an elder who lives down here, but is originally from, I think, Wiki. And um, the class was just like this really neat combination of students who were coming from all these different experiences and backgrounds to learn and to reconnect. Um, and, you know, I'd been involved in tribal stuff before that, but that was really my first dive into learning the language. Uh, unfortunately, because of like silly things, the class only lasted for a year. I, the elder retired, which was totally understandable, but they had a problem trying to find a replacement instructor because the university required you have a bachelor's degree. And, you know, education is such a touchy subject for so many people because of that history um, of trauma and that related to schooling. So, yeah, that was, that's my connection to language. Um, after that, I made a documentary with people from mine and surrounding communities about language and how film and language really connect mm. and how like I view film as a tool that can sort of help bridge some of the gaps that I think that arise when you're trying to convey these like, indigenous viewpoints and thoughts in English, which doesn't necessarily translate everything. Um, and then from there, I got connected to the Sundance uh, Indigenous program. I was a Full Circle Fellow, which is a program that helps young people who are Native and really interested in filmmaking, um, specifically people in mm, New Mexico, Michigan, and I think Mississippi. So if you're watching mm -hmm. and you are between the ages of 18 and 24, keep a lookout for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then from there, I... Uh, did some social media stuff, did some other stuff. Now I'm here, really excited to be here. <laughs> and we're excited to have you here. Are you kidding, Caitlin? Uh, yes, uh, 
you know, it's it's one thing to uh, do a lot of great work in in Indian country, you know, grassroots work that we do, but um, it's also you can do so much more if you can communicate using social media and TikTok and stuff like that. So I can't wait to to see what you develop for us in TikTok. Uh, that's going to be that's going to be fun. Caitlin, what's the name of the documentary that you made? Oh gosh, um, so <laughs> I made it a few years ago. Uh, it's called The Stories We Share and I have it on uh, Vimeo. Uh, from a filmmaker's perspective, I would have made some different technical choices, but like the content that I got from the people I talked to is amazing. Hmm. How long is the documentary? I think 37 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Been a while, but yeah. My first cut was like an hour and a half long, and I sent it to um, an advisor that I was uh, getting some guidance and feedback from, who's also native at my university, and she, she was like, "Ah, uh, so I'm not gonna watch the whole thing because a lot of it was like just the same material over and over again, but like said in a different way." And so like those subtleties I really wanted to include. But anyway, I guess at 37 minutes, it's like not too long, but maybe a little. <laughs> <laughs> Caitlin, is that the one that I watched? You The one that you watched and are also in, yes. <laughs> oh, oh. It's really, no, it's, it's really great. So Caitlin and I actually met when she was doing this project. And then we ended up working together um, and then um, now we're working together again. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Our, our paths keep leading us back to this good work. I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You should share that doc with Shannon and Jamie. They would love yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think sure I think I remember seeing a little bit of it as I was vetting her resume. So um, I didn't watch the whole thing, I have to admit. But now I have to. Um, <laughs> Because it would be cool to, I wish I, I would have thought about it and we could have shown a little bit of it uh, during our show together. Um, and Colleen is doing all sorts of things, uh, being famous. She's in documentaries. She's in fashion shows. Um, what <laughs> else? You're, you're all over the place, Colleen. <laughs> Uh, I think what you're talking about is a ribbon skirt photo shoot. <laughs> so, it's simply just for pictures. No fashion you still over here. It sounds like, like, like a fashion show to me. <laughs> no one's invited me to model ribbon skirts, so that's fashion to me. <laughs> yeah, well, I definitely, since we're talking about ribbon skirts, have to give a shout out to, to Graham Edie, Edie Nichols, who makes most of my ribbon skirts. She's amazing, and I always say, she is the best uh, ribbon skirt maker in all the lands. No offense to anyone else, she just is. <laughs> oh, and that's another thing about Rutherford Falls is that um, it's showcasing um, native designers. And also you'll see things on the walls and in other places that you normally don't see on the set of a comedy show, um, like a feather fan and, and there's this thing about beadwork, the story about beadwork that is is part of the show. But um, uh, so I'm hoping that it's going to to push some people to actually buying native made items versus the urban outfitters um, inspired native uh, types of crap. Um, <laughs> crap. Mm. Yes, it's a, that's a term of art. So that that's a y'all don't need to know about me. There's nothing y'all need to know about me, is there? <laughs> well, I think yeah. I kind of already know each other because I've been watching the Red Hoop Dogs for right. a while. <laughs> but share more. Yeah, I'm I'm so um, you know, I think there a point in time comes in your life. Um uh, somewhere between um, um, motherhood and beyond as you get older, I'm, I'm 52, um, where you, you don't really care about talking about yourself anymore. It's like you've had it with yourself. You already know too much. Um, uh, you don't want to go down that, that you never know what might you, you might uncover if you start, you know, uh, looking at things. 
uh, with a little more wisdom again. So you just kind of ah, um, <laughs> put it aside. But um, uh, you know, it's 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 really cool to be um, uh, part of the Association on American Indian Affairs. You know, I got involved in it as a pro bono attorney, right? And and um, uh, was always amazed with the really good work that it was doing, but no one ever knew much about the association. It's not like the association had a lot of marketing or talked about what it was doing. I always called it the most humble organization I know. Um, and it was always, I always looked at it as that's my dream job, right? If I ever got the opportunity, that would be my dream job. And, and, um, the first time the the executive director job came open, I, I didn't apply for it. Uh, I wasn't ready. And I always thought a nonprofit job would be good later on in life, right? Um, and then the second time it came around, it was one of those opportunities. I, I just couldn't, I knew it was, I don't think I knew it was time, but it was definitely um, something I had to do. And when I came to the association, let me tell you, it was a complete mess. Because if you think about a hundred year organization and all the files, <laughs> think about um, all the history of this organization um, that had always been really uh, not well funded or it went through ups and downs. Um, and it was working so hard to fulfill needs in Indian country, it really never took care of itself. And, and so there was all of this wonderful history and infrastructure that was never created about this organization and its stories weren't being told. There was all this story, we, you know, the organization went through every single era of federal Indian law and policy, you know, from the early 1900s to today. Uh, and none of those stories were, were told. So, you know, I think that's one of the things that, that we're all committed to doing is making sure we understand our history and then figuring out how to use that to move forward over the next 100 years, right? Um, so I've been working really hard over the last three years just getting the organization to a place where you all could come in and be here. And, um, and then we had funding and we have um, ideas and directions and a great board. I think actually one of our board members is on. I saw Al Ketzler coming on to say hi. He's watching on YouTube. Al Ketzler has been with the Association on American Indian Affairs for more than 60 years. Al's in his 80s. I won't say how old you are, Al. I'll just say 80s. But he's Athabascan, and uh, the association worked to help um, Al and um, uh, and his people in Alaska um, uh, get a lot of support from Washington D.C. Help develop the Alaska Native um, Claims Settlement Act and some other efforts in Alaska. Um, I think. It, there's some stuff in one of our newsletters about it, actually. Um, you know, so we have a long history of working uh, with Alaska tribes. And Al is kind of a, a, a mirror of that. Um, and um, yes, there I go off on a tangent again. <laughs> well, I feel like we touched on Colleen, but we yeah. didn't like dig in. We didn't so, dig into Colleen. <laughs> <laughs> so so we were talking about how we made it to the association gosh my hair i'm so sorry jeez oh, oh, come on, we're all, we're all... i can see like a piece sticking up um well well what i'll say is that um when i i was i grew up in northern michigan um i grew up i started growing up on Mackin island and then i moved over to st agnes which is just below, just above the Mackinac Bridge, um, and then I went off to school, and then um, I guess what I knew my entire life was that I was a little bit different than everyone else, and I didn't understand why. 
And um, whenever anyone would ask me what I wanted to do with my life, and I would always say, I want to work for my tribe. That's what I said. I wanted to work for, for my people. And so after I graduated, that's what I did. I came in um, back to the UP. I was in the Lower Peninsula for school and started working on a three month long gig. That's it, just a three month gig. I took, I left a full time job for um, in substance abuse to work a three month gig in our education department for the Sioux Tribe. And it was also, it was a suicide prevention grant, a really large SAMHSA grant. So it was really cool. I got my foot in the door and that's when I met for uh, Angeline Bully, that's who my supervisor was at the time. That's how I met Angeline. And um, I don't know, this grant ended and I didn't have a job. And I was like living at home with my dad again, which was like super cool. We had a really great chance to bond. And like, um, you know, once I got older, that relationship was really great. And and um, I don't know, I was like freaking out. It was like applying for jobs that I was overqualified for, but not even getting interviews for. And I was like, this is it. This is like, this is where it all ends. <laughs> I went to school for nothing, but um, our, our, our cultural department um, ended up opening a job called the Cultural Repatriation Assistant, and what they were doing is hiring someone to learn from, from the um, gentleman, uh, Mr. Cecil Pavla, who had been there for about t like 17 to 20 years or something at that time. He was getting ready to retire, and so they needed someone to learn from him and, and to pick up that work, and um, it just so happens that I... I interviewed and I had a little experience under my belt having done a repatriation with the Saginaw Chippewa Indian tribe um, from Central Michigan University when I was going to school. And so anyway, I got hired and I studied under him for a few years and then he retired and I took over um, as the repatriation specialist and uh, did that job for another four or five years. And then I uh, moved over to working for a nonprofit for a while um, and then I came back to the tribe and I spent the, a year and a half there as the director of language and culture. And um, during that time, I think, you know, what what was really important to me is that repatriation has always been um, a part of my professional career. Uh, but it's something that I never I never like set out for. Right. Like nobody like woke up and was like, I think I'm going to do repatriation work. Um, but it just like fell on my lap and it just made sense at the time. And I, I um, I'm thankful for the teachers I've had that kind of um, helped me to understand what this work really meant and, and to put me in a place where I understood these things and, and what I wanted to do next. And um, I'd worked with the association many times um, in the past, like even with Shannon on different projects, international repatriation stuff had been part of our annual repatriation conference a couple of times had um, been to most of the conferences, I think only missed one, and um, just uh, really looked up to Shannon and others in the field and um, really um, thought the association has an amazing place in, in Indian country. It's positioned very well, and um, the work that the association does is really, really um, incredible work, and, and I'm passionate about all of the things that we do. And so when this position came open, um, I was in a place in my life where I was I was, I was willing to move to Maryland. You <laughs> can ask Shannon. She even asked me one time on the phone, like, "Are you sure?" <laughs> well, say anything. Remember, our office is all virtual now, and that's <laughs> that's so we could keep everybody at home, right? Yes. You didn't have to yes. move to crazy, yucky Rockville, <laughs> Maryland. <laughs> I was actually willing to go, though. I was like, ready. Yes, you were. Like, this is my dream job. I I really want it, but I was so nervous and like. You know, it just worked out, and and um, here we are. So that's kind of how I I got here, and how my background and experience. And enough about me. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, you know, I always, you know, I don't know if you all have this, but I I think that I had a couple of turning points in my life and my career, and I don't know if if you all have these two where like something happened or someone said something to you and it just kind of really pushed your direction in life a certain way. And I know one was uh, uh, my grandmother, you know, came from my grandmother. And I've talked about this before. Uh, she would go on and on about these stories of basically survival. Uh, you know, at the end of her storytelling, it was always like, 
holy hell, you know, how did she even get here? Like, how did, you know, and she doesn't just, she never just talked about herself. She talked about the family that she knew and grew growing up with. Um, and it's like the fact that they, they were still alive and kicking always, always surprised me uh, with the struggles that they had, um, including boarding school and, and violence and, and sexual violence and other things. Um, and, and then at the end, of course, she would always look at me, you know, that grandma look and said, you know, our family went through all of this so that you could be here. And, uh, you know, it's your job to go to school, make things better, right? N no direction. It's not like we had any lawyer, teachers, or really anyone from any profession except you, um, uh, factory no, work. No pressure, right? No, no pressure. At all. <laughs> but, but that was always something But I was able to hold. It was like she gave me a purpose, like she gave me. And, and also was there when I came back from school and was going back and forth and I would tell her what I was learning, right? She was always there. And it was through that relationship, even college until she passed on where I was coming back and I was talking to her about the, about boarding schools, where I was talking to her about, um, the Indian Reorganization Act and the end of the allotment era, era and how that affected our family and the boarding schools and how that affected Native families. And, and she would find closure in understanding that history uh, because she never, you know, growing up, she never understood why these things were happening. You know, why is our land being taken away? Well, you couldn't pay taxes, right? Um, and so, um, you know, your allotment got taken away or, um, you know, that's why your, your mother didn't want to speak the language and, and pass that on and, and so forth and so on. So she was one. And another one was um, uh, Lumby Larry. I'll tell you the story of Lumby Larry. And some of you out there may know who Lumby Larry is. Um, he's in California right now, but I went to school at Cal State Long Beach with, with Lumby Larry. And uh, Lumby Larry was out on the quad at Cal State Long Beach one day and he had this blue book, this blue kind of paper book that he was working through. And I'm like, had some kind of acronym on it. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, for my LSAT. And I'm like, you're what? What is what? Um, he's like, LSAT, you have to take a, an, an exam before you can get into law school. And they use that to kind of judge whether you're good enough to get into law school. And then he started telling me, you know, you, there's these other tests. If you want to get a master's or PhD, you have to take these kind of exams so they can, you know, tell if you meet some kind of intellectual mark that they want to, you know, bring you into a, you know, one of these programs. And I didn't know what I was wanting to do. I was, it, it took me 11 years to get my undergraduate degree because I worked my way through. Um, so Lumby Larry was, you know, studying for his LSAT. And I'm like, well, you know what, Lumby Larry, if a Lumby can go to law school, well, I sure can. <laughs> and so I, for some reason, uh, whatever that was pushed me into this kind of comical trajectory of, of wanting to go to law school. And um, I, I really didn't know what the hell I was doing or what that even meant. But I knew when I looked at those cases, uh, you know, in, in some of the law books and heard people talking from that, those cases, um, it was clear to me that, that the logic and common sense of our government and our Supreme Court justices was, was totally whack. And I wanted to figure out how I could um, change um, that history. So um, those were the two things that kind of pushed me into where, whatever the hell I'm doing now.
<laughs> whatever story that we're all going to be creating together. Um, uh, what about you, you all? Do you all have any kind of stories that pushed you where, where you needed to go? Um, I do. I, maybe I can go while you guys are thinking. Um, I think I've told this story before, but I, I always, uh, come back to it. Um, and that's, um, uh, Cecil Pavlot, he was my, Cecil Pavlot Sr. He was my teacher, my friend, um, my so role model to me. He was my supervisor um, and, and taught me a lot about, a lot about repatriation and how we care for the ancestors, but a lot about just being kind and, and teaching me a lot about like our ways. And um, when he was my supervisor, um, I came into this work uh, when I was just 21 years old and I was still like young, wild and free, you know, like living it up on the weekends. Um, and then, you know, going into work, you know, working through the week and um, Cecil kind of started seeing this pattern with me that he wasn't, um, he wasn't fond of, you know, he just, you know, sat me down one day and, and um, you know, and, and said like, you know, you're, you're at like a fork in the road and like, you can either choose this way and, 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 continue working here and on on this path of initiation initiation of Mazuin, like you can follow this path or you know you can you can go the other way and there'll be no hard feelings just don't show up on monday and i was like okay cool 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 thanks for this talk <laughs> you know like still like just being a jerk about it um but over that weekend i remember like thinking like um yeah, you know, he's right. I'm kind of being like immature and like doing this dumb stuff, you know, and like it's over, you know, spilling over into my work and like that's not really who I want to be. And and um and so I showed up on Monday <laughs> to tell him that I I chose work and I and I chose this life and this is what I wanted to do. And I think um I think I, I I'm so thankful for him and I've said this to him so many times and he's not like a mushy person, so he will never like you know, he won't, he won't have this conversation with me in a way that I would like to thank him for this moment. But um, it really did change my life. And I think it really like set me straight because um, I was, it was, it would have been really easy for me to, to go down that drinking path and that drugging path. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm thankful for him for that. And then the other, I think, turning point for me is just, um, you know, working with the ancestors, you can lie in this life. You can you can tell mistruths. You can act up. You can you can fool a lot of people, but you can't fool the ancestors. <laughs> and so, um, I remember a time when I I was doing you know something dumb in my personal life, and I I remember like working with the ancestors a day or two after that, and like um, just like I tripped and fell and like busted my knee up and like I dropped my earring and like it's just like everything was going wrong and then I like I felt like this overwhelming feeling of like the ancestors like laughing at me and I was like what like and it was really funny because um the ancestors if you listen they have a lot to say and a lot to show us and like a lot to tell us and even laugh with us and like joke with us and I think they were just letting me know like stop doing that dumb stuff because we see you and like you're not going to come in here and fool us and um, that really like, <laughs> I never did those things that I had done again before repatriation, you know, and, and like just making sure that I was being so respectful, coming in in a good way. And, 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 and um, you know, I just think it was the ancestors who kind of, Cecil started me on the right path. I think the ancestors finished it for him. <laughs> so, that was, that's my kind of two moments, I think. Yeah, that's a that's a big moment, and and I know Cecil and the association honored Cecil a, a, a few years back for his work in in repatriation. Um, yeah, he builders that really um, help develop the direction and uh, in in that work for all of us. Mm -hmm. So what about you, Caitlin, Jamie? 
Any cool I was going to let Caitlin go. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think it's a really hard question for me to answer just because like I'm in my mid twenties. Um, I feel like I'm still going through a lot of that. Like I don't have the perspective on it yet. Mm-hmm. Like I can think of certain instances, but I, it, like it hasn't played out yet for me. I don't, do you know what I mean? Um, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it, it takes some distance to, to understand where, where the moments were. Um, uh, you don't sometimes you don't really see them clearly when they're right in front of you um uh, but that's that's the fun part and i think one thing that i feel really lucky and grateful for and and i kind of feel sad for for white people in a way um and and maybe i'm wrong to feel that way but i think we have a different sense of sacredness like like more things have more meaning, right? Does that make sense to you all? I mean, it's not like, you know, you wake up and you go outside that the sun looks a certain way and it has some kind of meaning. Um, And it's almost like it's in our blood memory. Like there's some, there's a connection there that I'm always grateful for um, and that can speak to us if we just listen a little bit. And so um, that's what I found the difference between my 20s and now my 50s is that I can be aware of those in the moment versus, oh, wow, um, you know, looking back at them. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different experience. But, but I feel like, I, I feel like uh, indigenous people have a, have a connection that we're closer to than other people because everyone's indigenous, right? That's sometimes a hard thing for to think about, but we're all indigenous. We all came from a place. We were all birthed out of parts of this earth we were supposed to take care of. Yeah, some of us didn't do such a good job. And then they've took a note, taken over others' lands um, uh, because they didn't do such a good job with their own. Uh, and, and, and that's where we're at now, but what do you think, Jamie, what's, what's your, um, was there a special moment that, that has happened? Um, for me, my big, for a long time in my life, my focus was really on just creating a better life for my family and making sure that, uh, we like my partner and I making sure that we were providing just a better life for our kids. And so that was like, we were leading like a very money focused life. And um, a couple years ago, I don't know if you guys can tell, but I'm in an RV. So um, we travel around in a fifth wheel full time, um, all around the country visiting places. And so um, we're, as we've made the decision to focus on, you know, kind of choosing adventure in life, um, you start really analyzing how you're spending your time. And I'm a I love my day planner and that's what my other podcast is about is like creative planning. And, um, as I've gone through that time, I've created all these really neat events for people to attend and we've created all of this content and I've seen the power of sharing your story and being vulnerable. And so as I started to learn the language and think about what I wanted to spend my time, um, I had been on like a podcasting webinar where they're talking about growing your business and things like that. And someone said, um, the, the guy pointed out, he said, uh, you can have, it takes about five years to get good at anything. Um, and so as you get older, that's exponentially a shorter timeline for you to be able to get good at something. And when you're in your early 20s, it's really easy for you to, um, it's really easy for you to come in and say, um, you know, I've got all this energy to put towards something. But then when you're Um, you know, I'm 40. And so when you start talking about like, you're going to spend the next five years working on something, what is it? What kind of impact do you want to have? And that was when I just really started to reflect. I'm here learning my language and studying all of this, like putting together timelines of the history of the US government, bumping it up against family genealogy. And I just said, you know, if I'm going to be spending my time doing something, I just don't know that, you know, working in a real estate office or editing podcasts about mindfulness and, you know, um, like very Western 
<laughs> meditation and reflection or, you know, life coaching or something. I just, it's not going to be fulfilling for me to spend the next period of my life really focused on that sort of thing. Where can I take my skill set, skill set and make a, make a shift to be really impacting things that I care about. And um, so that was when I started refocusing, well, where, where in the communities could I be serving better? Where in the communities could I be bringing my skill set to be helpful um, to people beyond just, you know, my family. And so um, I've just made a shift to be focused on working inside of Indian country and trying to find opportunities that, you know, like this, where I can make an impact. And, you know, there's a portion of this role that is um, really involved in public education and responding to general inquiries in the inbox, um, uh, you know, not only of kids asking for help, you know, how to apply for the scholarship and getting, you know, helping them through that process, but like, a good question for Colleen, you know, someone called and they said, you know, I was cleaning my mother's home and found a piece of pottery that I think needs to be repatriated to a tribe, you know, and so understanding what the best steps are to direct that gal, I mean, that's going to make a difference for somebody versus, you know, um, and not to discount life coaches, but like editing a life coach podcast for, you know, <laughs> so, you know, it feels like the things that are happening are really important and it's a time that people are listening. And so it seems like the right time to, you know, focus on uh, helping people that have the desire to uh, engage with the community and, and make things either right or, uh, you know, repatriate items, uh, educate to be back at investing in their their communities. And so there's a lot of neat work happening here and I'm just excited to be like a, a small piece of it. <laughs> well, what is your, um, uh, oh, something's going on with Facebook. Um, oh, we're having some technical difficulties perhaps, but um, uh, you were having an interesting week, weren't you, Jamie? You were telling us about some of the interesting things that you will have to deal with in your, your job. Um, oh, did you want to talk about some of those? <laughs> it, I, as I've been managing the general inbox this past week and inquiries are coming in, I'm just like, wow, people sometimes send like the most awkward questions that you get asked as a native, like to this inbox. And I, you know, the first couple of times I'm like emailing Shannon, I'm like, do we respond to stuff <laughs> this. And there were questions about, you know, I got a DNA test and how do I uh, claim my Indian money and how do I, um, you know, apply for a scholarship because I heard we've got Native ancestry. And, um, you know, it's just, it's really interesting. And then, you know, and then the next email comes in and it's, you know, Carol from the Leonard Peltier <laughs> defense fund uh, asking what we can do to help. And, you know, I, it's just such a broad range of things happening, um, it, you know, in that inbox that you just kind of never know what's going to land in there. So it's, it's pretty wild so far. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We get inquiries from, from all over the place and all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, some are, some can be considered highly offensive and, and others are, are actually, um, uh, you know, come from unique and uh, interesting places. Uh, so uh, yeah, it really takes some, some art and skill to um, uh, do that, what you're doing, Jamie. Uh, and we're with strangers who are calling and, trying to figure out what an Indian is. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's, it's definitely interesting to be manning that, you know, uh, so far. And I, you know, it's definitely one of those moments that you pause and you think, you know, am I the person to be answering this and responding to this? But then I think about, you know, the time that I've spent educating myself, the fact that I have you all as a resource. And even when I was you know, having the discussion about coming on board, I was like, what happens if I just get in over my head and I don't know what to say? Am I just going to have to figure it out or are there folks that can help? And that was what I was so relieved about is that I had you all as a resource to be able to say, you know, 
throw something back to the you guys as a team and say, you know, what's the best way to tackle this? How do we address this? So um, that made me be really relieved because, you know, there's so many times that there's questions that get asked when you're just an individual moving through this world that you're just <laughs> you're like, ah, I don't know what to say <laughs> to this person, you know, so yeah, oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And that was just week one, hey? <laughs> that was just week one, yeah. So, Woo, here we go. Can you tell us more about the repatriation conference, Colleen? I haven't looked into it too much, but I'd love to hear about it just as someone new. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I love talking about the repatriation conference. <laughs> So um, yeah, well, the, the conference will be on our seventh our seventh annual conference this year. It'll be November third, uh, tenth, and seventeenth. So it's going to be one one um, main day um, every, uh, every week for three weeks. But there will be smaller events and and different things happening in between there. It's also Native American Heritage Month, and so we'll have a bigger presence through the month. And then um, also because like Zoom fatigue and like people have a hard time sitting for an entire conference for like three days straight. So we really like um, wanted to, to do it one main day per week, which I think we'll, we'll find will be um, pretty awesome in the long run. Um, but yeah, so the, the repatriation conference um, brings together um, lots of different professionals in the field. So you have like your tribal practitioners, tribal reps, people who do NAGPRA, four tribes who are um, tribal people, native people. Um, um, and then there's like museum rep representatives, legal legal representatives. There's people from you know education institutions, from federal agencies, people who are interested, general public. Um, you might even get some people who are like um, working with our like dealers or auction people. Um, they kind of like to come and check things out. And then there's also just like um, um, people who are, are um, working in archives, libraries, things like that. So they all come together. And what we try to do is really like um, the conference is one um, about education, right? And then also like community. So how are we going to progress NAGPRA work forward? Because the ultimate goal I think that we have as the association who who serves Indian country specifically, you know, is always about compliance and bringing the ancestors home and 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 um, supporting Native nations to do that. So um, it's it's a great conference, and um, I was part of it for, for you know the six years, and now I get to be on the other side of things and helping to like plan from from the inside, um, you know, internally, and and it's like whoa like this is so exciting i don't know it's like blowing my mind like i said the other day like sometimes i think about it i'm like i can't believe i i get to wake up and be part of this this is incredible so um shannon definitely might have other other things to say about the conference but um that's kind of i hope that helps explain well <laughs> and on rutherford falls uh nagpra is mentioned on Rutherford Falls. So keep watching. <laughs> and and she actually say says the words, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, a federal law. And it's like, what? <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah she probably didn't use it in the wrong context, but it was, it was great. <laughs> Now Colleen's got to clear her schedule for the rest of the weekend to go binge watch the show so she can yeah. see. <laughs> totally, you got seven days free on on Peacock. Watch all, watch them, um, uh, watch them twice. Uh, it's it's the greatest show ever, and we need to like uh, push them to do season two. Uh, they kind of so, left a cliffhanger there, so I'm I'm assuming there's going to be a season two. That's let's, good. Let's hope. Let's hope. Um, wow, I got us off the beaten track there. But re repatriation, we're going to be, um, we just had a call for artists, right? So we're going to be choosing an artist's logo here soon to help represent the repatriation conference. And then our next is I, probably next week, um, y'all are going to be putting out a request for proposals 
for panels for the conference. And so our theme this year is uh, accountable uh, the past. to the past, committed to our future. Yeah, accountable to the past, Teamwork. committed to our future. <laughs> yeah, and so, that was great. So, so the conference is focused on that. And so the panels will also be um, themed and, and talking about uh, uh, how, how we put that into effect. Um, and we'll be talking about more than just NAGPRA, but international repatriation, right? Um, and uh, return of cultural heritage from other places where NAGPRA doesn't apply. Um, uh, Lance, Lance is um, uh, one of our uh, regular guests. It's nice to see you, Lance. Mm -hmm. um, he says, he says, finally, Indian jokes. Um, uh, did I miss it? Was there an Indian joke that 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 we just said and and I missed it? Um, but he but he did ask us, what do you say? What is an Indian? So we were talking about um, uh, talking to general inquiries about uh, what it is to be native because there's a lot of people wanting to be native and have done a DNA test and. Um, uh, you know, have certain ideas about what it means to be Native American or have Native American identity, race, et cetera. Um, it's a really complex question and sometimes it's difficult to be, to respond in a good way that's healthy and educational, um, right? <laughs> I mean, do yeah. you all have you all ever been approached by anyone? They say, "Oh, you're you're Indian. Oh, you don't look like Indian or um, Indian." Um, you know, um, do y'all ever have that happen to you? Not me. Oh, yeah. Never. <laughs> never. <laughs> never had. No, no. I wear my feathers wherever I go, so like people know, right? <laughs> Um, I, I just yeah. remembered a cashier at Trader Joe's one time shook my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I was wearing a t-shirt from um, NTBS and it's like uh, styled like a 80s rock band and it says Sovereign Nations on it. And then there's like a list of uh, reservations on the back and stuff. And he was like, oh, is that a band? So I, was, I told him what it was. And he's like, oh, are you native? And I told him I was. And, he was, and then he shook my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so strange. I remember that whole interaction. I was like, what is happening? I just want some chocolate, please. <laughs> yeah, I think of the time that um, the first, my husband and I were at a wedding and uh, it was kind of the first time that when we've been together that someone acknowledged that I was native and kind of launched into an apology, um, which I think almost everyone has endured uh where people want to apologize for the way that native you know on behalf of all americans they want to acknowledge and apologize for the way treaties have gone and it's this very awkward like interaction that you kind of have to endure you're just enduring um and it, it's you don't really know what to say because you're just you're at a wedding <laughs> and uh, you're here to eat some cake and have some barbecue. And um, you're just not necessarily, I mean, you're caught off guard. It's not necessarily, you know, aware of, <laughs> you were ready for this moment. You didn't have anything prepared to say. And, um, and my husband was just a little bit deer in headlights, surprised it, that this was happening. And, you know, I listened and thanked him at, to be respectful and did, educated beyond the questions that you know, were initially asked. And then, um, you know, it, it, where do you go in the conversation from there? We still have another hour to sit here <laughs> together at this reception. And uh, when we got in the car to head home, he just said, um, he was like, has that ever happened to you before? I'm like, yeah, not my first rodeo in that one. And, you know, so it's, it's very interesting because a lot of, uh, a lot of people can, there's aspects of their life that um, are private and this is becomes a very public thing that you're um, not really, I mean, you're just, you're moving through the world and it's, it comes up. <laughs> so it's yeah. having this kind of constant accountability for who you are as a person and having to 
be aware of some of the issues so that you can speak to them when it comes up in person. And it does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And depending on where you are, um, you may be the only ambassador of <laughs> Indian people that that person will ever meet in their mm -hmm. lives or think mm -hmm. they meet, right? right. Yeah. yeah. Um, because, you know, we're all over the place. Uh, mm -hmm. We're just not recognized as such. Um, right. it, it's, it's very odd because we know that we don't, even the association, we don't represent nor can we represent all of Indian country and all native indigenous peoples, right? Uh, we're all diverse, uh, we're so diverse, um, but there is this kind of weird burden that we all shoulder that when those questions come up or if we hear something that's, that's inherently racist about native people. Jesus, around around here, the DC area, you're constantly bombarded or used to be bombarded with the R word and the Washington football team. And it's like, Jesus, I have a responsibility all the time to say, to educate everybody, <laughs> you know? So, so, so it's, it's a very, um, it's a very weird, position to have and especially working for a nonprofit like we all do I mean it's it's our job to help push the agenda with the public right um, how do you all feel about that do you are you are you ready to have that that burden because we do all shoulder that that together in, in our roles that we have. Yeah, well, this is definitely something that we talk about a lot, Shannon. Yeah. I think that I've I, I I think that I've been shouldering that burden for quite some time, um, but might be much different in my role now. But yeah, I used to say I wake up um, in the morning and I go to work to like traumatize myself and then I come home to heal and then I go back to work to like re-traumatize myself and then I come home to heal. And it's just like this constant cycle because um, you know, working in repatriation so long, like it's not, it's not, it's not glamorous work, right? Like this is hard work. It's hard because you're working with federal laws and you have to be an expert and then you have to worry about state laws and local laws and, and, and all these partners and agencies and things going on. And then it's hard spiritually and, and physically and mentally and emotionally. Um, and so I feel like, yeah, um, you know, when you work for Indian country, you're, um, well, it's a lot like um, the comment I said last Red Hoop talk, you know, and essentially, you know, we're professional mourners, like we're being, you know, a lifetime of trauma exposure, even if it's not, you know, it's, you know, intergenerational, it's historical trauma, it's psychohistorical trauma. We've got, um, and then the, the, the current traumas, right, that our people are still experiencing, whether they're on reservation or off reservation, right? And so, I feel like that burden, um, it exists for everybody, but, you know, it's like we, we do work in a nonprofit that serves Indian country. And so we don't just carry our own traumas and things we're experiencing, but we hear it from the people we serve too. They come to us and, and, and they're wanting help or if, if we're, they're reaching out and, or we're reaching out to them and, and, you know, this work is hard. And so, um, sorry to go on a tangent, but it is, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot, like how my own spirit has been shaped by the trauma that I've experienced in my personal life, but also in my professional life. And like where, you know, sometimes it's tiring and it feels like a lot. And then other days it's like what fuels the little fire inside me. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's a lot about self care too. For sure. And I think it's also important, you know, I've been working at the association for three and a half years and it's been really hard because most of it I've, I've been alone. <laughs> you know, I've had, um, you know, some support here and there or with contractors or um, uh, support staff, uh, but really not a team to help take on uh, this work together, which is not easy. You know, um, 
uh, looking at myself and say, what is it about me that I always want to follow the losing team? <laughs> like what? Um, why it, you know, I, I was always OSU. I, I never was an OU fan. And those of you from Oklahoma kind of know that dynamic and, and the same with, um, you know, geez, we always learn, lose our court cases. Um, in Indian country, uh, you know, our loss is always greater um, than others in whatever you want to uh, bring forward. And it's like, what is this about us? And, and all I know is that what I'm hoping is that the four of us can work together to help lift one another up so we can continue in a, in a healthy way as a team and and that's the most important thing because we cannot do this work and do it well unless we have each other's backs and that we take care of each other um, so that's what's really important um, to me and and all of us being here so I'm making a, a promise to you that that's that's um, that's what we're here to do and that's how we're gonna work going forward and and um, and I hope um, that we can um, get to know each other, um, uh, not always in public like this, <laughs> um, uh, you know, but uh, through the work that we're going to be doing together. And it's so cool from parts of, of Indian country, um, you know, on the ground. And, and Jamie, with you traveling around all over in, in your RV, um, uh, porting back uh, on what's going on. We may send you on some errands out there when you're roaming, roaming the roads. Do it. Let's do it. Let's go see what we can find. So, well, that was funny. I was telling my mom, like, when um, when Deb Haaland, uh, when her announcement came out uh, that she had, you know, become secretary, it was, uh, I was on the Yavapai Reservation standing in line to get fry bread. <laughs> And uh, when the, my phone started dinging and I was with my daughter and I was like, oh, it happened. <laughs> and there were other just folks standing around and we were all like, oh, like all of us together. And, you know, there's non-natives that were, were there and they were kind of like looking like they had no idea what we're talking about. And um, it was just this big moment. It was kind of, it was just neat to be in that place in that moment, you know, with my daughter. And, you know, we had just come from a we had actually just come from uh, the a small national park called Montezuma's, they call it Montezuma's Castle. And, um, and we just had spent kind of the afternoon where there's a castle. It's not a castle, but it's a, a cliff dwelling that's in the side yeah. of the mountain. And so we had uh, learned all about it. And so uh, it, it was kind of just a neat day to be together with my daughter and just have that all come together as an experience. So it certainly opens us up to, to be in, in certain places where natives are uh, throughout our lives a little bit more in depth than what I would if I was just living, you know, in Gilbert, Arizona, where we've been, we had been living, so. Right, right. Cool. Lance says something interesting here. Says he can't do trauma and be native at the same time. It's really interesting. I picked the lane of staying native. Is lean on their healing. Being healed keeps a sharp eye. That is some damn good advice there, Lance. Thank you. Um, that's true. That's true. Sometimes we just forget, right? We just forget. We get distracted and we um, that we have that we have healing and and one another mm -hmm. so what what kind of stuff are you all eager to work on i mean are there issues in indian country or certain types of work that you all are interested in particularly i know colleen's very interested in repatriation work as well as some health and healing um efforts um but caitlin and jamie what about you I'm just really interested in continuing the public education and really looking at new avenues and trying to attract new audiences. And this is all leading to me just saying TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've got to be able to do some kind of like joint TikTok 
um, I don't know, something. We should all do some kind of TikToks together. What are y'all you in for that? Do you think that that would be good Ooh. public education? Is that what you're looking to do, Caitlin? That's really, really interesting. Yeah, I'll definitely think some more about that. I know um, it's really people. So they're super quick videos, right? So yeah. it's like 15 to 30 seconds. So I have to think about how we can do that really effectively. You know, it would be interesting. I'll just throw this idea out there publicly and randomly. Uh, it might be interesting to take some of the questions that we get in our general email box and toss them over to you, Caitlin, and put them out there on TikTok and see how folks would respond to it. And um, I think that that could be a really interesting way to leverage that platform uh, to, to help us get a feel for how people are feeling about some of the emails that are coming in in Indian country too. Um, I mean, there's no reason that we can't, you know, group think this through <laughs> with members of the community and not just have the expectation that the four of us are going to have all the answers. Um, that could be a really interesting way to help people share how they're feeling too. So, I mean, yeah. write it down. Yeah, we'll do I, it. I have written it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's our writing our notes. Good idea. Mm -hmm. Native really TikTok good. is like popping. <laughs> like and res talk i didn't know that was a thing until recently Re res talk too like it's like different hashtags right so native tiktok was like the hashtag for a long time but i just realized like res talk is one of the other um oh. like uh hashtags on on tiktok i don't I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I started seeing it pop up in, in uh, the beadwork like community and a lot of people doing like the res talk beadwork. And so I was like, what does that mean? And I had to go look at it. And I was like, oh, and then now I hear it all the time when I'm watching a show. And um, it, if there's natives in it, you hear it in the in the scripts. And it's all throughout Rutherford Falls. We talked about that a bunch. So. It's neat to see. Yeah, a different, definitely different dialogue for sure. And it's just, I think it kind of goes back to what Shannon was saying earlier. It's just like sometimes we have different ways of connecting and different worldviews and, and things that kind of come through. And I think it's regional too. Because mm -hmm. I definitely see like different ways of communicating with, with our uh, brothers and sisters in the Southwest compared to like, you know, up in like the, the North for sure. Mm -hmm. That's what's been so hard about being um, um, quarantined or just, you know, not interacting with people like I'm, I'm used to. I feel like I'm, I'm losing that, the way of speaking. I've, I've been talking through Zoom calls for so long. I feel like I'm losing, I don't know, any quality about who I am. I'm just... I'm this two-dimensional thing in a box, right? I, um, uh, Lord knows if I have to put on real pants, what that's going to be like. Um, so maybe two-dimensional box is fine for now. I thought we all just own stretchy pants now. I didn't think we had to have anything else. <laughs> that's, that's, yes. Um, I, I can't even imagine. Like, I, I feel like I need to, it's spring, right? I need to go look in my closet and clean it out and put the summer clothes in. But it's just like, oh, what do you need? Just a couple of pairs of stretchy pants and a pair of shorts. That's all. <laughs> it's horrible. Well, I'm glad at least, um, you know, when we, we work together and work for each other, we, we don't have to worry about those things. We're really focusing on, uh, on our work and not, getting dressed for work, right? You know, I, I, I used to dress up every day for work. And so now I have all these clothes that I don't even wear. Like, I don't even know what to do with all of them. Like blazers and dress pants and high heels and things like that. And I'm like, all I've been doing is buying stretch pants. <laughs> I got rid of it all. Like, I think I own uh, I own a couple of nice dresses uh, as my backups, but I ended up getting rid of it all because we've been working from home for so long. And um, I, I had it sitting in my closet and there was literally 
one point where I looked at the back of the closet and there was just dust on all the tops of the, like the shoulders of my blazers. And I'm like, okay, I think we can get rid of those now. <laughs> and I've gotten rid of them all at this point. I have a couple of nice dress shirts and those two dresses and then that's it. So I feel like you probably have to be pretty cutthroat though, like with your storage there. Well, the thing about it is that I realized is that um, if I did have something that I would want to go do, like when the world reopens and we're participating in, in things, I just want to go get a new outfit anyways. So, you know, no mm -hmm. reason to keep it. <laughs> that's right. And and now we can just watch Rutherford Falls and say, hey, that's a good shirt. I'll go, go to Be Yellowtail or or wherever <laughs> see yeah. native somewhere um and 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 buy what what um what she's wearing mm -hmm. <laughs> speaking of that i think i i have to say one thing that i did um during during like the world being shut down um in the last year is that i was really focusing because like um since I couldn't go out and shop, I was like shopping from home, right? Like most everybody. And my online shopping game is on point. But what I was doing is supporting in like indigenous, black indigenous people of color, like small businesses, instead of like going to Amazon where I could buy something in two seconds and it would get here next week. I was really trying to like, in fact, I'm part of like a, my um, indigenous breastfeeding group. There's a group of women that um, I'm part of like this large, um, Facebook page with them and we started listing out like all of the the BIPOC like um, stores that we knew of um, that you could order online and so just trying to like really um, feel like I'm supporting and doing that in like a good way instead of just like you know Amazon or Walmart or whatever those Meyer big stores like that and well, I guess Meyer's actually Michigan based. You said Meyer, and I was like, oh. <laughs> they so take Meyer off the table. I always jump at Meyer. But Meyer's like, amazing. <laughs> I experienced it for the first time a couple years ago, and I was like, what is this store? It's like a little baby Target. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's Michigan. It's like Michigan uh, based, right? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we do shop at Meyer. I'm taking Meyer out of my previous comment. I'm, I'm <laughs> retracting that statement. Thank you. Um, but yeah, how how what do you guys think? Like, did you start like supporting more BIPOC? Like small businesses are really like being, you know, like looking into how you're spending your money and things like that when you're shopping online. Yeah, hundred percent. I know for me, um, so the pandemic was like a little rickety for me as far, as far as finances and stuff go, but still trying to be a mindful shopper and also keeping a very long list of beaters that I intend to buy earrings from in the future. <laughs> um, we were at my grandparents' house and my grandma is always mildly disturbed when I get a box because she thinks it's like, she's just not used to this Amazon world where you get like boxes all the time and so when I did order something I always had to kind of open it in front of her because she's like what'd you get and so I always felt weird about ordering anything so I just scaled way back but um no I think I've shopped for I've shopped smaller for some time just trying to buy less um <laughs> trying to buy less and then um just shop small when I can so <laughs> yeah and I've been um, you know, working in Indian country and then spending time at the National Indian Gaming Commission where I was going to all of these uh, Indian casinos, I was really surprised with how many Indian casinos and their gift shops do not sell native made things. Yeah, it, it would just kill me. Like even, even like, um, all right, so I guess you have to you have to sell um, uh, um, what's what are those cigarettes that uh, the cigarette company that was always suing all the the Iroquois and other tribes that sell cigarettes? Philip Morris, all the Philip Morris brand cigarettes. It's like why are you all selling Philip Morris cigarettes and 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 these dream catchers that look like they came from Japan or somewhere. You know, it's it, it, it was 
really um, crazy to me that um, tribes weren't looking intertribally to develop business and commerce. I think it's a lot better now and it's gotten better over the last 10 years, but I think we still have a ways to go. We should be buying native beef, you know, we should be buying uh, native foods as much as possible to, to, to have in those, um, some of those casinos, but definitely our native artists um, should be showcased in those, those gift shops. And so, yeah, so I'm, I, I, I've always been uh, looking at indigenous people's shops and stuff online or, or conferences, usually conferences. That's where I've always bought things um, uh, and getting to know the artists and folks that are, are, are making things, but now everything's online. So it's, it's great. It's easy, but I'm, I'm one of those people that, you know, I, I'm, I'm really, as I getting older, finding that, um, you know, we have so many things that we don't need in our lives. Um, and so really trying to be just conscious and mindful about, you know, what is it that I need and, um, uh, um, what, what do I need to show, uh, pride and, um, uh, for like, you know, you know, what kind of, um, things do I want to buy and wear that actually mean something? Because I remember there was a time in my life where, um, and going to school, you know, I didn't have much of anything. And so those things that were given to you um, had all this meaning. And it's like, even your dishes, like I, I never ever had to go buy dishes, right? There was always someone to give me a set of plates or some silverware or or a couch or a rug. And it just seemed like things got passed down and, and um, uh, you know, had stories attached to it. And I feel like my life has less of that in it and I, and I don't like it. So I want to try to bring, bring some of that, that back, that, that connection and, and reuse and recycle, right? <laughs> it was a really unusual journey to have to downsize an 1800 square foot house into a small, like this is a different rig than what we started in, but um, going through that process and really narrowing down your most precious items. I think I got it down to about five or six, like 30 gallon totes of things that we don't bring with us that we keep in storage. And um, it's really interesting how disposable everything is in our society. If you don't like it, you just go to Target and get another one or, hey, it's spring. Let me go, you know, pick up a new set of dishes is the attitude that a lot of folks approach things with. And so you start seeing all of the stuff pile up and I'm guilty of it. I mean, that Target dollar spot gets me all the time, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. and so it's uh, it's definitely having to be a lot more disciplined with saying no to things and um, saying yes to things and picking and choosing what you let in. So, mm -hmm. but you're right. There's it's there's so few items that are really like genuinely precious in that way. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. So we, um, I've been thinking about what should be a good kind of final question that we all explore in our time here on, on the show tonight. Um, I was thinking about, um, you know, where we want to go or where we want to take the organization together in the next 100 years. Um, is a big question, but I wanted your input about what what you all are thinking about right now, how you think we should kind of close the show tonight. Any ideas? Sorry, I have this thing I do with my eyebrow. I like to... <laughs> That's a hard question. <laughs> Well, come on. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I mean, I feel like in my short time with the organ, the association, um, what I've really seen is that there's like a funneling of issues from all over um, the country and, and sometimes the world funneling into the inbox to be kind of escalated up and prioritized. And so, I mean, I guess in a hundred years, it would be nice to not 
have the need for that any longer <laughs> long term um you know and so it, it's like it, it, you would hope that it, the need would go away within the next hundred years um you know but i think that being able to prioritize you know i've started learning so much about language and language leads to culture and culture leads to things being created and things being um valued in a different way and so i think that as we all get back closer to our culture or prioritize these things um that there's a lot of issues that kind of clean themselves up over time so um it's hard to know where to begin. And that's something that's actually been really overwhelming for me looking at Indian country as a whole is like, there's so much work to do. Where do you begin? So um, I guess we'll see is what gets prioritized uh, by need, you know, so. That's an interesting way of looking at it, you know, thinking about how do we put ourselves out of a job, basically? Mm -hmm. yeah. How do we, right? Um, and uh, which is, you know, our vision, it says it in a nicer way, right? Create a <laughs> world where diverse Native American cultures and values are lived, protected, and respected. Because if, mm -hmm. if that's happening, then some of those inquiries you're you're getting in the inbox, you know, aren't, aren't going to be there anymore. Mm -hmm. We won't be having interesting discussions about the one and only Native American sitcom that's ever been. <laughs> in 2021 <laughs> right it's so wild freaking 21 yeah that's right do you got anything you're thinking about there colleen i was gonna let you go okay you just seemed ready so i wasn't sure um uh i think for me like interacting and engaging with the association's current work and materials and thinking about the next 100 years, the phrase, there are indigenous people in the future keeps coming up in my mind and like uh, sort of trying to open up, maybe not like take the space, but like make space for other people to fill, um, to sort of allow for that to happen in the future. And it definitely will happen, but um, I'm also, sort of approaching the work really informed by um, like Anishinaabe teachings of how important it is to lead a good life, but also that it's important, um, in my opinion, not only to walk on a good path, but to leave one for others to follow behind. So in my role, I would love to sort of push the ball forward, I guess, in a way that um, creates this system of communication and sort of this background of information so that somebody who maybe would come in after me would be able to plug into uh, a visual language, but also a communication strategy that helps to unify all of these sort of grassroots movements across Indian country. As a new person here, that's one thing that I really know that the association does and does really well is act as an, a hub of information and a hub to connect a lot of people who are experiencing very similar things, even if they are specifically different instances. Um, so like protecting of sacred sites or somebody's working um, in a tribe for repatriation and has questions and just wants some community in doing that work. Um, yeah. yeah, that's beautiful, Caitlin. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Guys, this team is so cool. I was like, follow it up, Colleen. Bring so, us home. Uh, yeah, I don't know how I can follow that. Uh, you guys are pretty amazing. But um, if I could just maybe add to that, um, I would say I, I think that that there's been a lot of good progress, but the fight is far from over. And, and um, I see the association just kind of has always really adapted and, like, listened and heard uh, Indian country and heard what issues were important to Indian country and, and really um, focused our efforts in that way. And I just see that those issues will just change and and um, things, we, we tackle those issues, you know, one by one, right? So we adapt and we work towards whatever is important to Indian country, right? Because that's who we serve. <laughs> so um, I see that a lot of progress has been made and especially like having like a, you know, a a Native American um, cabinet member in, in the representation we're seeing in the media 
in literature and um, you know and and all these things and like I think also one of the things that really um, impacts the way that issues work in Indian country is you know our you know whatever the current administration is and and so there's a lot of like law and policy and things that really impact the way that um, um, we do things in Indian country because a lot of a lot of uh, Indian country, you know, we have a lot of you know federal funding and things going in and out of Indian country, and so I see a lot of different issues that have made a lot of progress. But I do think the fight is far from over, and so our next hundred years, I think we do what we do best, right? And that's what we advocate for Indian country. That's what we do, and and we, I, I'm excited to be part of that for however long I'm going to be part of that. And I, I really appreciate what you said, Caitlin, about leaving, you know, um, leaving uh, things like for whoever is going to be here well after us, you know, we have to look to the past too, before we can, you know, look to the future. So yes. I really, um, I love the work that the association does, but um, I think that the, the issues in Indian country will change over time and what's important to Indian country and what issues we're facing and those things will change. And we just, we just adapt and keep doing what we do best. That's how I see it. Yeah, that's beautiful. I've been thinking a lot about my prayers lately because though my prayers will be about my family and things that are close to me, I spend an awful lot of time considering my prayers in relation to what it is I'm doing and how I'm carrying myself in this organization. And I've spent a lot of time praying for our ancestors and to make, to hear those voices, to direct me, um, to hear those voices so that I can advocate for those voices of our ancestors. And a couple of weeks ago, as I'm outside and I'm putting some tobacco down and I'm like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the ancestors and I'm thinking about those before us. And something clicked, twisted, and said, do you hear us yet? <laughs> um, the future that um, there, are, there are voices ahead of us that we also need to remember not to ignore that need to pull us in certain directions, right? Um, the Haudenosaunee often call those the faces that look from, from the earth at us, the, those, those faces, the, the children who haven't been born yet, right? Um, and to listen there so that, you know, the work of the association is pulled forward in the direction they need us to go because the ancestors may not be able to help us all the time. You know, we've got to also listen to those, those voices ahead of us too. And so um, whatever that means, I know for me, it was, it was really meaningful to be reminded that, um, uh, uh, that there were, um, uh, that there may be a stronger pull um, than a push sometimes. Um, so I'm going to be uh, doing my best to keep keeping my ears and my eyes and my heart open uh, so I can hear that. I've really appreciated been, being able to spend this time with you all in this format and sharing, um, sharing uh, the space with folks that listen to Red Hoop Talk. I'm always grateful for folks that um, take some time to spend with us. Um, next week will be on Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern uh, with a wonderful uh, professor from UC UCLA. Uh, but um, with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna step back. Anything y'all want to say or, or close with? Um, just. Really nope, that was it, Shannon. We did it already. Is that? <laughs> I'm looking forward to going to watch. I'm going to download the Peacock app and watch yes. this show. <laughs> looking forward to that. But 
Uh, thank you. I just wanted to say miigwech. Um, really enjoyed this time and looking forward to to being in this space with all four of us. Maybe not necessarily this space on Red Hoop Talk, but this virtual space a lot more. <laughs> hmm. Well, we're we're always here, and if 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 you all uh, need support out there in Indian Country, give give Jamie a call. <laughs> Send your email to general at Indian Affairs dot org, um, and you'll get a hold of Jamie, and 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 she can uh, tell you all about DNA research, right? Oh. <laughs> and, uh. and where you can get your Indian check. No, we're just we're just kidding. Um, uh, really grateful to have everyone with us tonight. Um, until next time, this has been brought to you by uh, the Association on American Indian Affairs, and from all over our homelands in Indian Country. Um, uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Yakoki.